any review by stakeholders. Stakeholders, of course, include us, and we are looking forward to having a say into what those regulations look like, and particularly because they should indeed be able to support investors. So what has been the impact? Because I think that's the crux of the matter. What has been the impact of the Petroleum Price Stabilization Administration? I think the first one, and I've already alluded to it, is that the absence of a legal instrument in the name of regulations is really, and we said we need to be candid, is really a blot to predictability. I know Governor Morethi, or was it Governor Morethi? No, it was uh, one of my directors. Um, Director Leparan said that you cannot um, give certain, certainty. You cannot guarantee certainty. Absolutely. But you can guarantee some form of predictability so that even as you're pivoting around and being agile, in the event the predictability becomes elusive, you're working from a point of known. And therefore, uh, predictability, and we all know this, particularly in, in any business segment, is really a key ingredient to business sustainability, to accountability, to transparency, and to stability, no doubt about it. You may not guarantee uh, certainty, but surely predictability should be granted. So what has happened is that in all this, because of the absence of the legal instrument, uh, we have found that the oil marketing companies' net revenues or margins are most like, most people prefer them to, um, you know, deferring this indefinitely. Of course, we've seen what it does. It, it has completely disrupted business strategies and plans, and it has resulted into financial incapacitation that has led to the inability to meet investment obligations, including the efficient procurement and timely distribution of your products. The second thing is that the undue pressure on the oil marketing companies' uh, cash flows, which is uh, resultant from the absence of this predictability instrument, and the disruption and the pressure also on the working capital and financing costs has certainly undermined the viability of the existing investments. And, and, and this is apparent to everyone. And, and it does disincentivize future capital investments and diversification. Because obviously you put everything on hold when you're not sure when you'll access what has been deferred, you know, um, without any, you know, what has been deferred indefinitely. Your, your business strategies, which are normally done in five-year tranches and activated on an annual uh, basis, they're completely thrown out of the track. So the lack of a clear methodology, obviously, of when the stabilization will kick in, which should be entrenched in the regulation, the timeliness or the timelines for the disbursements of the deferred margins, the management of the fund kitty is certainly a recipe for opacity or opaqueness and bad governance. So uh, the expectation is that these regulations should be able to cite when will the stabilization kick in. Is it when the prices, uh, global oil prices are at 100 shillings, uh, are at uh, um, $100 per barrel? Is it when the local prices are at 100 shillings uh, per, per liter? When will it kick in? Because of course it has to be sustainable. When will the collaborators, the oil marketing companies, access their deferred margins and make up for the losses incurred? That is what predictability does. And we're not saying it has to be today for tomorrow, no. But some form of predictability. Is it two, two, two months? Is it three months? Is it four months? What is it? The second thing that has been uh, impacted on, on the petroleum price stabilization uh, uh, you know, uh, administration is a serious exposure of the risk of fire incidences. For people who work in this sector, they know that safety is paramount. If it's not safe, don't do it. But you have observed for yourselves the people queuing at the gas stations actually have plastic containers. That is not a receptacle that meets the standard. Why? Because a plastic container is permeable. So what will happen is, even if the liquid is contained inside, the vapor will escape. So if you go and store that jerry can at home and it interacts with a, a, an, an ignition source, that's a recipe for disaster. And that's why you'll find the emergence of slum fires. You will find cars going alight. And I'm not being dramatic. Uh, the, the industry is here. They can speak for themselves. The safety requirements for receptacles are really, really of high regard. And that is why you never see petroleum. If you see petroleum, that's bad news. 
Think about it. It's explored, exploited. It's all through pipeline storage, pipelines, until it goes to the nozzle. You don't see the fuel. Then all you see is the nozzle in your tank. You don't see the fuel, and there's good reason why you don't see that fuel. Controlling the crowds at the, at the retail stations has been difficult because the people are anxious, they're angry, so the attendants cannot tell them we'll not sell in those receptacles because of the kills that then would come from that. Additionally, the natural order of procurement and distribution, of course, has been disrupted, and I'm sure this is no secret. You have seen the change in terms of where supply uh, should be 60% local. It's now a different arrangement altogether, and that comes with serious, serious disruptions that have a loss element in it, and hence the importance to actually have this conversation. The other one is the serious exposure to illicit trade and smuggling, and also petroleum products, I, yes, time, uh, malpractices. So I won't speak to that as well, but let me say this. Certainly there has been a punishment of the compliance with the own marketing companies because they've had to bear the brunt of being penalized in spite of the high compliance levels and dedication to keep the country supplied at their cost. Uh, even when we know that that cost is still elusive in terms of when will it be compensated. And it's also important to note that we pay for our taxes upfront, uh, which is another issue that perhaps we need to discuss um, going forward. So what are the solutions for the gaps? The first one is to prioritize the gazettement of the governing regulations by hastening the formulation and the stakeholder input process. They are now at EPRA. Let's have them quickly at uh, National Treasury. Let's have them with stakeholders. In the short term, Absolutely. Um, our view is that the key the key stakeholders uh, being the oil marketing companies, the National Treasury, the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining, and EPRA. We think at the very least out of this meeting, there actually should be some resolution to have those stakeholders sit together for purposes of drawing up a binding agreement in, the, in lieu of the finalization of these regulations, because that's in the short term, so that we can, fit, we can establish what the timelines for the disbursements of the deferred margins or losses, if you like, uh, will be paid out, and also what kind of formula will be used, because like, you know, the prices are going to be, uh, you know, the new prices will be posted on the 14th of, um, of this month. It's uncertain as to whether the current losses will be included in the, in, the, in the pricing formula. So last but not least is one of the solutions we also think is to actually have a national tax policy that's holistic. Um, and this tax policy we envisage will review and justify all the existing taxes, including those in the petroleum sector. And this we believe will help in preventing or mitigating against the arbitrary changes to the tax system. And we also think that the policy will support a predictable business environment and it will facilitate sustenance and accountability because what we believe is that there should be equitable taxation across board. Let me finish off by saying that really the oil marketing companies are fully committed to serving the country as they've demonstrated and what they are seeking is certainly collaboration and certainly support to ensure that they meet the obligations of keeping Wanjiko supplied at least cost. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as well, Your Excellency, so allow me to now invite Petroleum Outlets Association of Kenya, Martin Chomba. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank you. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, uh, Raila Odinga, um, all pro protocols observed. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you allow me to speak um, uh, in not a very official language. I represent a segment of this society and the value chain, as uh, uh, Wajiku alluded to, uh, the people that are at the very end of the value chain. And these are the people who you find, everybody here comes from a certain village, and uh, you know you'll find some people with one pump that, uh, fa that, that, that is the mode or that provides the mode of propulsion to those um, uh, items that uh, provide energy, things like uh, the pro boxes, those, uh, the border borders of those sides, the centers, the, get the things that really propel the economy of the rural. Uh, so what um, 
we uh, first of all I say I want to really thank you uh, uh, Prime Minister because of availing yourself even to seek uh, to understand uh, from the horse's mouth uh, the issues bedeviling the industry and uh, on to seek our opinion on what we think can be done uh, to streamline the industry. I want to I will speak very fast because I know we are pressed for time uh, and I will speak to the event or what has precipitated to the issue that we have out there. Um, first and foremost is that uh, we have a membership of this group because we've been very informal. It has been fragmented. Uh, three years ago we came together and formed that organization. We've been able to form um, a membership of around 3,000 petrol station owners across the country. And um, these people are serving in upwards of 40% of that non-franchised market. Um, and these are the people now who are forced, has been formed, uh, faced by this issue of supply lately. I don't want to, to talk to about the issues of what precipitated the issue of supply because we have enough and uh, competent policy makers here who are able to understand that and relay the same to you. So for me, what I would say, uh, I would that want to talk about is in the pricing formula of uh, ERC, there's an issue or rather a lacuna that um, has existed for some time and this is what has exposed the non-franchised to uh, kind of a constricted margins and they're not able to supply as they should and get uh, something out of it. In April, from April last year, uh, the government started the subsidy uh, program. But I think among the negotiations of the subsidy program, one of the things that had to go is the wholesale price cap. So, uh, uh, Prime Minister, what we have been faced with is, from one end of the supply, EPRA tells us you don't sell beyond this market, beyond, beyond this value. But on the other side, they have removed the wholesale cap. So what does this do? What it does is, it has given the, the, the market a leverage of where they can push the margin, depending on the constraints within the market. They can push up the margins to uh, where we are right now. We've gotten to a place whereby you cannot get the product, and if you get it, you'll get it at the pump price. Mark you, you are getting it and transporting it to the village, and the, most of us are domiciled in the very remote places. So uh, what has happened is that the, the end result of this is that most of us have had to close. And when we closed, because this is the, as easy as it is, it is not theoretical, don't, we shouldn't go trying to get theories as to why we are here, where we are. It is this simple. This market, which is over 40%, have had to close because there are no margins. So when it closes, so what does this do? The people that are in the village, I come from a very remote village in Krenyaga called Kangaita, up there in the forest. So in the place where I come from, there's a single pump that sells super. So when that guy does not get supply, what happens is that everybody who fuels there have to run to the Kerugoya town, where there's an there, no, Anmut national who is providing some services. And we thank God because they have been keeping us moving. So what happens is that when every person in the village from my, my county has to go to Kerugoya to get the product, then it is not enough. There's a lot of pressure. And when this pressure mounts, the, the fuel runs out of that petrol station. So the net effect is that everybody will panic and will believe there is no product in the country. Because the turnaround time for the trucks to go to the depot and get the product probably is eight hours or so. So at the end of the day, that has been replicated. And Krinyaga is a very small county, as you know. There are counties which are as big as central province. So you can imagine if the villagers have to go to the towns. So this is what has really now brought pressure to the country in a way. Everybody feels that there is a lot of issue. So my advice, or rather what we are advising is, Within the policy, the policy framework and the value chain, we need to make sure that when we are telling the, the non-franchised market, which is now has proven to be an integral part of the economy of this country, when we are telling them sell at this price, you, we must be very careful to, sell, to tell them we are telling you to sell at this, time, at this market, at this price, because you have bought at this price. But when we leave that lacuna, it can easily be exploited. Remember, we are a capitalistic system where people are, are running for uh, profit. Multinationals cannot be faulted. Why? They, uh, they need to remit uh, to their shareholders something. So at the end of the day, this has been the biggest issue. My recommendation is that even as we look at how we, we are going to grow the economy, uh, when a prime minister, because I know uh, God has favored you in terms of uh, the ability to articulate issues. Let us have a system whereby we take care of the independent 
uh, uh, indigenous uh, local companies who do not right now have a lot of uh, leverage in terms of even things like allege. Because if they have enough allege, they are able to give some to us. Because if you don't have a lot of network, you are able to give to others who don't have network. So in conclusion is, um, let us look at the, uh, the place of the independent market, the non-franchised market, with, uh, as a part and parcel of national security issues. Because the minute those people are not well, uh, their, their taps are not wet, then everybody else is not able to operate well. They may not understand a lot of issues because as I told you, we have been living in a very chaotic industry and some of us have just uh, trying to bring sanity and formal, to make it formal. And that probably informs the reason why the market, the informal market has not been put in the mainstream policy framework. But now that we have empirically proven that we, this market is very, very important for the... Previously, that needs now to get there. And the good thing is that we have formed uh, formal organizations and formal grassroots structures in terms of marketing that we are able to engage with the policymakers in a view to make sure that all those people are reached. Today, everybody is looking at us because they, they are our members to give us some hope on when they are likely to get the product. Because even as we are, as, as we are talking, there's still an impasse in terms of delivery of products. That differential that is coming, that the oil market, and we understand the place of the oil marketers. They are not able to sell to product to us right now because the difference between the cost that they should sell and what EPRA has recommended is very big and nobody wants to go to that loss. So it's as big, I think uh, this coming month, it should be as big as 40 shillings because the prices should be around 175 and uh, we, are, we, are told to sell, we are telling somebody to sell at 135. Without proper mechanism of guaranteeing that this person will be reimbursed, then you, we don't want to fault them for not releasing the molecules to us. So we ask that as government and as people who have ear of the government, make sure that as policymakers, you pass this forward that if we don't take care of that segment of 40%, upward of 40% of the market, then we are likely to have a very, very big issue in terms of uh, supply chain logistics. And uh, it will precipitate to issues that uh, could be even bigger than what we have seen. So uh, with those remarks, I want to really appreciate you for coming to us and listening to us. And any time that you need uh, information from the grassroots, we are the people that will be able to give you that information. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much, Martin Shonka, as well. Thanks, Lady Sam. Now we to invite the national. Your Excellency, uh, the Prime Minister, and Africa's High Commissioner for Infrastructure, uh, Raila Amolo Odinga. Your Excellency, Governor Nderitu Muredi, uh, the PIA GM, Madam Wanjiko, POC, uh, Chairman Bonachomba, colleague industry uh, captains, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon once again. Yeah, mine would be very brief uh, to echo uh, the discussions uh, that have been exposed by both Wanjiku and Chomba with regards to the nature of volatility in our current business environment. Like I had mentioned earlier, uh, initially, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw a drastic drop in petroleum prices. And then suddenly, uh, because of uh, the Russia-Ukraine issue, we have seen the same prices skyrocketing. And at that juncture, then we realized that we have to put in place mechanisms that are agile enough to guarantee our operations in the market. And before I progress much, uh, Bona Prime Minister, allow me to convey the apologies from my regulator and colleague, uh, 
uh, Chris uh, Chipto Daniel, who was not able to be with us here this afternoon, and those of our able peers, Andrew Kamau, uh, given the short notice nature of this convention. Uh, we said we want to discuss challenges and provide solutions. And from where we sit, uh, one of the solutions that is in place, especially for our friends in POC, is like you have seen recently, EPRA published Gazette notice for public participation on 30% importation quota by NOC. And principally, this is to come and support uh, the POCs of this country by providing sufficient knowledge for them through the National Oil Corporation. Uh, and in that case, then, we will be able to guarantee the security of supply, like the case was with the establishment of NOC. The second, and which I want all of us to think, is that today we have a disruption in the market because of the high prices leading to constrained cash flows uh, coupled with the compensation issues. Now, can you just imagine today if you are told somebody has disrupted our supply chain infrastructure in Mombasa, what would happen? And for that reason, then, the next intervention that uh, we uh, are trying to put in place is the establishment of the strategic petroleum reserves. You have seen in the initially proposed draft regulations uh, that the strategic petroleum reserves fund is going to be created to support uh, the National Oil Corporation to undertake the mandate of guaranteeing security of supply of petroleum products into the country. And I, I believe that once those things are put in place, uh, then we should be in a better place to talk about predictability and how we can, in an agile format, manage our environment. I think I will end my few comments there. Um, just to ask my colleague from the Kenya Pipeline Company to stand up and wave. And I hand over back to Governor Deritu. Well, thank you, CEO. Let's appreciate Governor once more. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. I should um, also recognize in the, in the House uh, the Honorable Shabal uh, from Mpigian uh, Makofi from Mbasa. Uh, Sylvester Kasuku is in the house, a former MD of Lapset uh, and policy advisor. I, I wondered, Prime Minister, if you, I shouldn't really ask Dr. Masharia to even say Jumbo before we invite you. So, Dr. Masharia, you know he is the one who moves the product on, <laughs> on most of our behalf. I think you better just come, Dr. Tari, if, if to only say hello, and then we invite uh, the Prime Minister. Your Excellence, the Right Honorable Raila Molo Dinga. I would like also to appreciate my Governor Lakipa, His Excellency Nderito, that's why he's harassing me. <laughs> Let me appreciate also the aspirant for Mombasa Governorship, uh, Shabal. I think he's also seated here as an investor in Gulf Power, Gulf Energy, ETC. Colleagues, good afternoon. good afternoon. The only thing I can assure your excellence is that Kenya Pipeline is full of product. I don't know where to take it. <laughs> As we sit here, I have 200 million liters of PMS. I have 160 million liters of diesel. And I have 60 million liters of jet seated. I have a Shirami who is seated in front of you delivering 120 uh, million liters of uh, super petrol. Then I have a vessel which is uh, also waiting to deliver jet, 120 million, in about two days. Then Ashrami comes back to deliver another 120 million of super. I don't know where to take it if we don't resolve 
this matter. So KPC, we are so wet. The country has all the product it requires for the next one and a half months before I receive anything else. Thank you. Uh, Asante sana, Daktari Masharia. <laughs> Daktari Masharia kama angeongea Kiswahili ndio mngeshangaa maana Kiswahili chake ni sanifu sana um, nataka niwashukuru nyote kwa mazungumzo haya na basi uh, daktari I may not I know he tried to coach me how to say it in, in Swahili uh, nilikuwa nataka niwaulize basi tusimame ili tumkaribishe uh, mheshimiwa uh, Raila Amolo Odinga atuongeleshe karibu sana uh, waziri mkuu This is Now uh you are visited Now um I really don't know uh, where to to start here uh in once upon a time in my earlier incarnation, one of my early incarnations, I was in charge of petroleum, or, or, or energy in this country. So uh, I've been listening uh, to those who have uh, talked here before, Asil Wanjiku, uh, not our uh, usual constitution Wanjiku, <laughs> talk, and she was talking a completely different language from um, the other somebody, <laughs> another language completely when he was telling us about his experience in the village in Kirinyaga uh, and then now we hear the KPC talk another different language somebody is telling you that I'm, I'm so I'm so full up I've eaten too much that's I'm almost busting with food. And somebody out there is saying I'm starving. There's no food here. <laughs> is it the same world, the same country? But we all know the, the, the cost of what we are going through here. Um, it's a global issue, as you know. Uh, cost, you can say it artificially. In my view, because of a war that did not have to happen, I don't know whether some wars have to happen, but because of that. Another thing is uh, our preparedness as a country to deal with the situations like this. Because you must know that uh, this kind of situation will always be happening in, even in the, in the future. So a country must all the time be prepared for any kind of emergencies. When I was a Prime Minister, I constituted a, a, a task force uh, on the petroleum industry. And the guy who was chairing it is with us here, Mr. Elisha Kasuku. That Mr. Kasuku. And they dealt with uh, a number of issues. One is eulage, allocation, and operational issues. The other one was taxes. The other one was petroleum products pricing control. Another one was storage and strategic reserve. Another one was quality control. And the sixth one was licensing of marketers and uh, oper operators. So this is, they the dealt in, in detail about these issues about uh, uh, the importation, storage, and distribution of petroleum products in the country um, so that uh, the customer or the consumer does not have to suffer unnecessarily because of uh, issues that have been artificially caused here. Um, the issue of, you uh, see, uh, the issue of uh, uh, the, the uh, the, the, the wholesaler and the relationship between the wholesaler and the retailer. Here you've got the, the, the big marketers. 
uh, who have uh, put a bit of cushion, because they've got the financial muscle, you know, to be able to pay or to borrow from the banks and, and, and bring in large stocks, if they can, if there's the small scale dealer, like the one in Kirinyaka cannot get, they then give their own outlets. So you now have these issues of monopoly, that you are the wholesaler, they are also are the retailer at the same time. You now competing with a, a small retailer out there <laughs> in Kirinyaga. Now you ask yourself, Jay, you know Ngwana, <laughs> so it is um, uh, an, an issue that really needs to, to be dealt with uh, uh, properly and um, because the, the government, of course, has also the, the strategic the, the reserve to come in at a time like this, but the government also does not have any other source government has to collect taxes from the people. And if the prices are much higher than the taxes the government is, is, is collecting, where does the government get that additional fund to pay? So this is an issue that requires a much more extensive national dis discussions that we come up with truly with a, a solution so that we deal with these issues not like an emergency, that we are responding to an emergency, but we have a proper roadmap on how we deal with these issues even in the future. I think this uh, would be my, uh, my, my uh, proposal, that uh, we uh, cushion the consumer from the suffering which is going on right now uh, at the moment. In future, I want to talk to our friend from the Kenya Pipeline Corporation. This country needs to address the issues of strategic reserves properly. And that we need to have strategic reserves at the point but inland. Because as you know, an enemy can just come and go down to Mombasa and bomb you are reserved there at the port. The country will be completely paralyzed. Then they will just then march into you the way Russia has marched into Ukraine. There's nothing you can do because you have no, no fuel. All your tanks cannot move. So we need to do this as a matter of uh, agency to begin to put up strategic reserves across the country in places uh, where they are not vulnerable uh, so that we are not uh, taken by surprise uh, in the future. Um, I'm happy that at least the government has now responded temporarily and that is going to help ease the, the, the suffering of our people uh, for now. But I think that all the strategic, all the stakeholders in this industry need to sit down and work out a more uh, comprehensive program of how to deal with this kind of situation in the future, uh, in terms of you know uh, importation and distribution uh, across board. Uh, and if this is done, in my view. We will, not be, we will not be able to face a situation like this in the near future. It's a situation that is avoidable, uh, it can be done, and uh, it must, can only be done with cooperation among all the stakeholders across this supply chain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate again uh, the Right Honourable uh, Odinga. Um, we want to come to a close, ladies and gentlemen, and again we want to really thank you uh, for this uh, presentation. Um, we believe ourselves that the way to uh, 
it's not enough just to highlight problems out there in the political podium, that it is far better, uh, frankly, uh, to sit together as sector, as industry, and craft solutions together. I, I, I think we are all sympathetic to what Mr. <laughs> Shomba did say, that the selling price is fixed, but what they are buying us at is no longer fixed, and that therefore they've been, their margins have been squeezed to the point that they are closing. And, and therefore, uh, I think that this is an immediate thing uh, for us to address, and, and we all agree with Manjiko and uh, the right honorable Prime Minister about uh, this question of the stabilization fund and the operationalization of these rules. Ladies and gentlemen, we propose to bring it to a close. Um, and may I uh, request you uh, to uh, remain seated to allow the Prime Minister an opportunity uh, uh, to leave, uh, and then the rest of us can. So let us appreciate uh, the Right Honourable Prime Minister, Raila Molo Dinga, and thank him uh, for... Well, thank you.